Welcome to the Elector Engineering Insights, the show that puts your engineering challenges to the industry's experts. I'm your host, Stuart Cording, and today we're examining the world of displays. Since the introduction of colour flat screen technology, displays have found their way into even the most mundane of applications, even in the most conservative market segments. And that includes the realm of industrial, known for robust buttons and chunky lit indicators, where today designers have entrusted their user interfaces to touchscreen technology. Joining me today is Alex Munden, an expert on display technology. In fact, his employer is so dedicated to this field that their company is called Display Technology. They're based in Huntingdon in Great Britain and supply customers across Europe. So, let's welcome Alex. Hi there. Hi, oh, Stuart. Yeah, good, thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. It's great to have you here on the show. I'd like to start by quickly asking you what your background is and how you got into display technology. Yeah, that's a great question. So I am I'm Alex Munden. I'm a sales engineer at Display Technology. I've been with the company now for about six and a half years. Um, I joined in our technical department, so really hands-on probably the best way to learn, in my opinion. Um, but as I've become a bit more commercially aware in my role, I've started to transition more into a sales engineer uh, role, as my title explains. And it, it really just involves handling not only our projects, commercial uh, sections of the projects, but also maintaining all of our um, engineering competencies from electronic, electrical, mechanical, um, how I got into it, I fell into it really. I um, I was applying for an apprenticeship, really just looking for something where I'd probably just be building PCs all day in a lab. And um, little did I know that there was this great big world of industrial electronics out there. And uh, yeah, just, just got my feet wet and run with it ever since. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you very much for that introduction. Now, as always, I have a lot of questions for my guest. However, the best questions are often those I'd never think of myself. And this is where you come in. Regardless of where you're watching, be it on LinkedIn, Twitter, or the Elector TV channel on YouTube, you can post your questions and comments directly to us. Throughout the show, we'll do our best to get answers or guide you to resources that might help. And between shows, you can also get in touch with me, Stuart Cording, directly via email, or Twitter. Okay, let's not hang about, let's get straight into it. So Alex, what I wanted to do at the beginning of the show here is put something together for those people who are maybe less experienced with display technology and okay. could be setting out on their first application. So if, for example, I was to come to you and I said, look, planning to use an ARM or x86 uh, single board computer, SPC, um, and we're going to connect it to a display, but we're not quite sure which way to go and what type to take. In our discussion, what would be the top five requirements that you'd want to be teasing out of me? Okay, it's a good question. So, um, so because I'm quite a, uh, a hands-on orientated person, I want to get a bit of an idea of, of, um, of what your solution is looking like. So my first question is really going to be what the application is. Um, you know, is it going to be a, a handheld or a wearable device or is it, uh, you know, a large advertising application that just starts to home in on what you're trying to, want to achieve there? Uh, my next question will probably be um, architecture of the system. Um, so as you said, whether it be ARM or Intel based and even narrowing further down into what exact, you know, architectural CPU you're going to use in, uh, as we know, some x they say they can have a, a, a GPU built into it. Um, and that can start to delve into maybe the contents of things. Next would probably be the interface for the SBC. So whether we've got a, an LVDS port, maybe a, maybe a MIPI interface on, on board, or maybe we've just got standard things like, like a DVI, HDMI, display port. Um, I suppose then we then get onto how many displays, um, which kind of top and tails the, the interfaces. So if you've only got an LVDS port on the board and you want three displays, that, that is presenting us a problem then, then maybe we need to rethink the, the SPC side of things. Um, okay. So I in that then we'd sort of situation, get... what would uh, what would be the re uh, the requirement? Do we need to look at a completely different SBC, or are there typically potentially, yeah, and that's sort of graphics yeah. inputs? Yeah, so I mean, if say like for instance, if you've if you're looking to do an application that requires say four um, 
three or four 15.6 inch 4k lcds and you've got a board that only has two hdmi ports on it then that's, that's not going to be up to scratch we might then need to look at something that's say got you know three or four ports on it um, and we can help with that we've also we've got an embedded division as well so we can start looking at that as a as a full package okay so if i was looking started out by looking on your website one of the things i notice mm -hmm. is that they're on the industrial monitors section we've got the difference between what you call open frame and um standard sort of monitors uh, what's the difference between open frame and monitors uh, open frame is essentially just removing the the front bezel of the uh, of, of the of the monitor so we, we provide like a metal frame that goes around it which really makes it a finished off product um, the reason we offer it as an open frame to begin with is we can either offer that front bezel design which sort of looks like just a, a, a standard monitor front um, or we can start adding some safety glasses onto the front maybe we make it a tr what we call a true flat finish so um, essentially the glass just seamlessly goes up to the edge of the monitor it just makes it for a much more crisp installation yeah and what are the advantages or application spaces where they want that really clean um, interface and, and flatness with the rest of the, the product? So if we are talking to a customer maybe that's uh, designing a, a kiosk and they want to offer the whole unit through the front fascia of their metalwork and then bolt it in from the rear, that, that nice clean um, glass front can offer a, a seamless um, layer between where the glass finishes and where the metalwork starts rather than having like a, a lip metal work that falls then into the, the front face of the glass, it creates nice, a nice seamless front for it, really where the, the visual aspect of the product is critical. Yeah, I guess it also makes it a lot easier when it comes to cleaning, because obviously no certain can sort of gather in, in the join there. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and that's, yeah, that's, that's another reason for doing it. It's a lot more um, easier to use cleaning products on the front surface. Now, one of the other interesting aspects of the product range that I found uh, looking around was uh, sort of fire load products. And that's a term that's not, uh, that I'm not aware of or been aware of before. What, what's a fire load display? So fire load is actually our own uh, product that we've made um, at our engineering facility in Germany. Essentially, what we've done is, is taken a... Um, what you may consider as a standard monitor and made it fireproof. Um, I like to describe it as a brick because it can literally stand up to heat that a brick would. Um, if you go on my uh, LinkedIn, so hashtag babyface guru that you see on there, there's a video on my LinkedIn of us uh, comparing a standard monitor and our BLO series um, for an application test with a blowtorch. So essentially we subject the front of the surface to 3,200 degrees centigrade okay. um, and as you'd imagine that the standard monitor that you might get in like curries or something like that um, burns to a crisp. <laughs> Ours course, is still sat yeah. there functioning and you can still use the touchscreen while it's doing that as well. Okay, um, obviously probably a little bit too warm to the touch, I should think. <laughs> yeah, <that> stage. <laughs> you'd probably be want to wear a fireman's glove, but yeah, it will still work. <laughs> <laughs> now the other interesting aspect of the display technologies on the market today is just the enormous range of sizes. We're very used as consumers to having tablets and, and phones, which have a, a fairly sort of standard four to three or 16 to nine type aspect ratio. But then you also have these stretch displays, which I've increasingly seen on the underground services that we have here in Munich, for example. Are there any challenges of, of having those sort of displays with such a, a, a wide horizontal axis compared to the vertical axis when you're trying to develop the, yeah, the, the complete application and output an image to the screen? Yeah, it's, it's a big software consideration because the, so the way these um, products are manufactured, we, we take a standard 16 by 9 aspect ratio screen and it's, uh, to put it crudely, the, the product is cut, it's physically cut. Um, so when we then uh, repackage that into its own chassis, what you see is the, say, the top portion of that 16 by 9 ratio screen. But as far as the TCOM board for the display is concerned, it still thinks that the system should be output in that full 16 by 9 aspect ratio resolution. So when you're designing the content, you have to understand that the content will be designed in a 16 by 9 ratio but only output in say a 16 by 4.5 ratio. So you have to account for that visual dead zone on the software element of things. Yeah, okay. So that makes it a bit more challenging than a normal display uh, when it comes to creating the content. Um, Correct. I guess another sort of 
type of display that's challenging with, with regards both to performance of your computing system as well as also creating the content itself are those those video wall displays. Um, I mean, they, the, what I understand is they have a very thin basal around around the edge there. Um, I mean, why, why don't all displays just have a thin basal to start with? That's a fantastic question. So um, the bezel free displays or, or very slim bezel displays, they tend to be more of a consumer or semi-industrial um, type of product. When you make a product like that, it can start to affect the, the rigidness of the product. Um, so it's not something that we tend to get involved with too much. We do have our sources for it, um, but because we strive to provide industrial product through and through, all of our product has these rigid bezels to maintain that industrial feel to the product. Okay. And then you also have uh, products which you call web posters. They, they seem to be, um, let's say, displays targeting a point of sale mm -hmm. or maybe um, uh, always on advertising. Yeah, essentially those are the same um, one of products as before. We just replace the controller on the inside um, to have uh, what we call the Arista platform, which is based on a Raspberry Pi compute module. Um, and that just allows the product to be uh, network enabled um, and a bit more of a cost effective uh, content management system that can be provided as well with that. And that's where it's sort of provided for those POS type applications. Okay. Now, when it comes to display technology, there's obviously lots of different types on the market today. We have TFT, LCD mm. and LEDs. Um, why would I want to be going into my application with an intention to use one particular type or is it really the application that draws me to the, the best technological solution? So for us, for an industrial product, um, TFT is uh, through and through what we want to provide us all of our product. Um, that's evolved to become a diversely capable um, fulfilling the needs of a lot of technological advancements recently. Um, due to its great imaging properties, as well as affordability, low cost manufacturing over time. Um, yeah, these have become drastically increasing the numbers in, in the market. I mean, if you compare it to something like um, OLED, for example, which we don't dabble in too much, um, mainly because although it was developed um, in around the, I think it was originally developed in around the 1980s, um, in 2008, you bring in something like AMOLED, um, which is when we talk about as you mentioned, your phone screens and sort of these OLED TVs, that's what the technology is based on. Um, although it's had a lot of um, R&D poured into it, OLEDs are still costly to manufacture in high quantities and they have a limited lifetime compared to TFT, LCDs and LED technology. So they're not quite industrial ready yet. Hence why we always strive to provide a TFT product. I've no doubt that OLED may eventually get there one day, but it's not quite there yet. And that's what we keep keeping our eye on. Okay, and so what's the core difference then between a TFT, an LCD, and an LED display? It is, it's a bit of a grey area, really, because a lot of our products we um, so we provide LED LCDs that are also TFT, so that they they kind of um, merge into the the same product. They um, they kind of just different parts of the technology that make up the product. Okay, yeah. So, so TFT is really sort of the, the primary technology which is at least being used in the industrial space nowadays. Correct. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're providing that in for, for medical applications, handheld devices, uh, large point of sale, advertising, uh, digital out of home requirements. So everything from, um, you know, your 3.5 inch displays right up to 65 inch displays. Um, it's the same technology throughout. Okay. So um, in the space of of all the uh, TFT displays that you have on offer, we, we see that there's there's a huge range of modules on on uh, available. We've got everything from sort of small, um, maybe an, an inch or two inch type displays right up to yeah. applications where you've created displays which are 99 inches um, in, in diagonal. Uh, at, at what point so do you need to use an SBC uh, to drive a display rather than maybe um, implementing it through um, a, a real-time operating system-based microcontroller? Mm, that's a good question. I said, normally, we leave that decision down to our, our, our clients. I think for, for most applications, I say when we start talking about a display of, say, 7-inch and above, that's when we typically then start getting involved in providing a, a single-board computer for the application. 
anything below that and right as you said our customers then start nominating a, a microcontroller to build onto their own um, pcb platform that they develop to, to fit into the product mainly because of a single board computer i mean we we typical size starts at about two and a half inch for us um, some of our customers need something more compact than that or of a, a weird format and that's where they start designing their own pcb with, a, with their own nominated uh, microcontroller super so um there's also the the difference between uh, trans reflective and transmissive displays what's yeah. the what's the core difference between those two types and and does one of them always sort of win out in these industrial applications when you're recommending um a display no there's there's no one right solution for all applications um that's why when we start these conversations we always ask what the application is um because it, one time we might go down the route of transmissive, one might be transflective. Um, transmissive technology is is the art of producing the brightness from the display purely from a from a backlight technology embedded in the in the display. Uh, transflective tend to be on a specification they look a lot dimmer. So, say we might provide a high bright display that would be a thousand nits, perfect for an outdoor environment. Um, a transflective display that could be perfect for an outdoor environment may only read on a spec at 150 nits. Well, that's because the transflective technology allows the ambient light to pass through the display and bounce back off the rear of it and uh, utilizes that ambient light to increase the, the optical performance of the display. So it's using that, that outdoor environment to further enhance it. But those transflective displays are only suited for an application that is going to be permanently outdoors. If you're going to be in a changing between an indoor and an outdoor application as, as you move around, and the transmissive display is probably there. Okay. So um, there's also uh, some of the, the displays that you have in your portfolio are, are marked as EMI shield, shielded. And I was just wondering if, if I have an EMI shielded display, what type of applications are those going into? Uh, a core of them are either defense applications or a big majority of them are, are medical applications. We've got one at the moment that we're working on for a... Um, it's uh, well, it's, it's going into a part of the hospital that's subject to a high amount of magnetic interference. Um, what we've done is, is we're essentially designing them a monitor solution that's uh, very fit for purpose by adding in not just an EMI shielded layer, but we've actually also taken a standard TFT module, stripped off the bezel of the whole product and redesigned it with our own frame. Okay. Because when you buy these standard TFT solutions, they can um, the, the frames of them can include highly magnetic materials um, in, in the metallic structures. So we've yeah. took that off and replaced it with our own non-magnetic frame. Okay. And that's really where we where we strive in our design um, elements of the project. And what sort of materials are then suitable in that case um, to make sure that uh, yeah you have a, a non-magnetic material? Are you again re relying on a metal frame at that point? But it's a still a metal frame, um, but it's one that our mechanical team nominates as a as a less uh, magnetically um, susceptible material. Okay, and when you've got so an EMI shielded display, is it also possible to implement a touch screen on those or? Um, is, is that sort of not possible due to due to that EMI requirement? No, that is that is possible. Um, it becomes a little bit more tricky with projected capacitive technology, but our advanced controllers and the, our firmware engineers that we've got internally have made great strides in being able to um, implement that technology in those types of applications that involve an EMI shield. Okay. So I'm just going to take a look now at our comment stream and because uh, we've got quite a few viewers out there at the moment I'd just like to say hello to Dom, he's out in the US and uh, he tells us it's uh, morning time there and uh, we've also got someone uh, watching in from East Nigeria. Don't forget if you want to get in touch with us you can use the, um, the hashtag ElectorEI on Twitter, you can write to us directly through the Elector TV channel on YouTube or you can drop us a line via LinkedIn. So I'm here today with Alex Martin from Display Technology and we've been looking at the various types of display technology on the market, mostly used in industrial applications and information displays. 
I'd like to move tack slightly now and move more into the user interface side of things. Now, touch screens have become standard. I think touch as, a, as an interface was really became apparent as the iPod, the Apple iPod came onto the market. And all of a sudden, once that was there with its touch buttons and its rotational wheel, all of a sudden, everybody wanted to implement some type of, time of, some type of touch interface. But um, on, in terms of displays, we're, for a long time, we've had resistive um, interfaces on touch screens. Is resistive still a technology that's used today, or is it really um, taking second place to capacitive touch interfaces? I'm glad you mentioned that. I think it's rude to, to not mention where we've come from, and resistive is almost like the, the daddy of touch technology. <laughs> um, although it's... It is a cost-effective solution and it can still be provided. Um, essentially, it works based on uh, pressure being applied to two electrode films. So when those two pressure together, the, the, the touch controller can calculate the X and Y coordinate based on that. However, they are limited in their size, um, typically up to about a, a 20 inch roughly. Um, and because it's based on these two films, um, it's a less durable surface. It can become torn um, and it's limited to single touch as well taken into all that account that's where projective capacity was thrived because it's not limited on all of those factors so that's a, a very interesting point because i've also seen that as well through my career that the the projective capacitive touch on touch screens is a lot more robust because the actual mm. capacitors themselves are on the back side of the glass aren't they they're they're behind yeah. the surface that's being touched and there's no moving parts unlike the the resistive touch um solution exactly. obviously you've got those those two layers now pr projective capacitive touch uh, the way it works is is very very simple essentially you're creating a very small capacitor and then human a human finger that's brought close to that capacitor changes the capacitance and the controllers that are used are measuring the capacitance all the time and then when they see small changes they make the assumption that there's um, a finger nearby and that can be turned into what's called a touch in terms of the software that's evaluating the surface of the, of the screen but um, obviously just detecting a finger is one thing uh, there's also lots of other things in the environment that can cause the capacitance to change. You've, you've got environmental factors, you've got uh, radiated noise and conducted noise. You have uh, maybe water or dirt in the environment that comes onto the screen as well. So what sort of solutions are available on the market on the capacitive touchscreen side to really give a robust response and make sure it's only human fingers which are recognised as inputs to the screen? <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's where our what, what I like to refer as our, our dark art comes into play. Um, we've got a a couple of firmware engineers that work for us that used to work for some of the factories um, out in Asia of the, the actual uh, chip manufacturers. So we many we select um, only a few different chips, maybe say from uh, companies like Elon Tech or ETI. Um, what we're able to do is tune out through firmware. Um, to, to reject things that may be seen as a, as a water droplet on the screen or maybe a, for a medical application, we've been able to tune out for things like saline and, and even blood in some instances. Um, furthermore, with through like gloved um, hands, we're able to tune so the sensor recognises a, a gloved hand, hand input all the way through to, to fireman's gloves with a, with a chainmail glove over the top. So they're wow. the kinds of advanced applications we're able to do now with the, with the kind of controllers we can nominate. And how much time does it take to, to set up the controller? Is it is it at all possible today to just link a, a screen and a controller and, and it goes and works? Or does every single display need that tuning process? Almost all of them in, in, in our applications, we, we strive to do a tuning process. Even if we think it's right, we still get our firmware engineer to come along um, and he just sort of remotes into the system for maybe half an hour to an hour. We'll just do a quick remote session um, with the customer. So they're in front of it, playing with the touch screen. Our guys in Germany sat there reading all the statistics back on your screen um, and then making adjustments accordingly. And we just make sure that we get it perfect. And then when we come through to production, we just make sure that we use that same firmware file that we've created. But in today's world, it's it's a very quick process. Uh, we just supply a standard product, and then, and then like I say, half an hour to an hour after the customer's got it, and we can we can have it production ready. 
And in your experience, what are the, the biggest challenges to getting um, a touchscreen to be really resilient? Mm, good question. If, if we're talking on the firmware level, um, sometimes it can just be the human factor, just trying to get a customer to replicate the screen in its um, exact environment. Because we speak to a customer and say, you know, uh, you, you've got your the prototype. Um, let's go and make sure that we uh, we replicate every possible scenario that it's going to be used in. That's not always possible. So sometimes we do have to go back and, and tweak it after it's been in production for, for a little bit and then um, apply that to further production units. If we're talking about actual uh, physical robustness of the product, we can um, adopt that through using thicker panes of glass, for example. So the, the projective capacitive portion of the product is, is done on a thin film on the back of a piece of glass. That glass substrate we put over the top, we can machine um, and cut to any size or thickness that, that is required. So we could go for anything from a one mil piece of glass, like what you might see on your phones, all the way up to say a 10 mil substrate that could basically take a beating from a baseball bat. <laughs> wow, okay. And what sort of materials are being used on the touch screens? I think in, in the past, I think we had uh, indium tin oxide was very popular for, for making the, the, the capacitive sensors, but also having a, a see-through effect. And some companies I used to work with in the past they were introducing various types of uh, copper-based solutions. Um, what's common today as a material? Uh, we, we actually mix it up depending on um, what's needed for the project. Uh, we've got a, a UK-based um, factory that we deal with that uses the copper method that you mentioned. So we actually plot it onto the glass using copper electrodes, um, whereas other methods are done through more like a, uh, a, a silver-based um, film that might be laminated onto the back of the glass. Uh, it really depends project by project on what we use, but both, both are still quite common. And how how much impact on the the clarity of the display does the the touch um, the touch glass have? Um, how how does that uh, does does the does the material sort of muddy the quality of the image at all? Does that have to be considered, or even the brightness? Not so much so anymore. No. Um, Especially if we use our, our UK space partner, because they're plotting straight onto the onto the glass. Um, apart from maybe being able, if you really took a microscope to the unit, you might be able to see the electrodes going through it. Um, but that's where we can nominate a display that maybe has an increased brightness to be able to uh, sort of alleviate some of those effects that might be seen through the type of glass or the type of touch ball that we've used. Yeah. Now, you also have an, an Infinite Touch product listed on, on the website. Could you explain a little bit more about that technology? So that, that's more based around our, our glass processing. So we have our own uh, range of touch foils that we uh, bring in sort of uh, pre-made, but they don't have any, any glass substrates on them. So they're, they're not production ready until we nominate that piece of glass that it's to be laminated to. Um, in that instance, what we do is we go to our customer and say, how do you want us to make the glass? What size? Where do you want the holes? What printing? Um, how big do you want the active area? How small? Um, and then we go away, we manufacture that glass and then laminate the foil to it in-house. Because there are, and we call it the infinite range because there are an infinite number of possibilities for that piece of glass. Oh, sounds very appropriate. <laughs> now, one of the case studies I was reading about on the website was a very large display, the one I mentioned earlier. It's a 99-inch display uh, that's mm. around sort of two and a half meters diameter. And there, an, an infrared solution had been used to implement the touch. Is How common is infrared? How, how does that work? Does it have to be in front of the display or is it integrated behind the glass? We don't come into it too much anymore, um, infrared, although we know it's still used in the industry. Um, the problem with infrared, especially on those kinds of sizes, is because it works by uh, light emitting diodes being on the X and the Y on one side, and then um, light detectors on the other X and Y, those diodes have to be perfectly aligned to be able to you know, create a, a good sensing field in front of the display. If they're even slightly out of alignment, it disrupts that field. Not a big problem if you're working on a small screen, but if you're working on something that's say 99 inches in size, your tolerances then start to become quite severe in the corners and it can cause some disruptions. And that leads to some poor, uh, as well with infrared, if we're talking about an outdoor application, um, you get poor performance in direct sunlight because it is based on a, on a light 
light source, that sunlight, interferes with it and creates a more poor, poor performance. So if I was going to be developing an application that really had that huge um, screen size and I need to implement touch across its whole surface, how do we go about that? Do I need to implement several touch sections with separate touch controllers or is that something that could be implemented with a single touch controller? We, I believe we could probably implement that on a, on a single projected capacitor. Um, layer because with the with the UK space factory that I mentioned we work with because we plot the sensors ourselves we're able to kind of chop and change the size of that active area on the fly um, so if, if anyone's got those kinds of applications by all means get in touch with me because that's <laughs> I'd love to work on something like that sounds like that's you're really ready interesting ready and raring to go <laughs> yeah you pulled up you pulled on my nerd strings <laughs> <laughs> So I'm just going to go back to our questions because a few questions have come in. Uh, there's one here from Dom and he's asking um, that it's always hard to choose a display because there's so many options. Um, I think a good question for you, what are the resources or the sources of information that you're regularly going to to keep up to date with the latest display technology on the market? So we, we regularly talk to our, our display um, manufacturers um, over our headquarters in Germany. I mean, they, they have calls with the main manufacturers like AUO, Inelux on a, on a monthly basis. We always get the roadmap so we know exactly what they're working on, what's coming down the line. Um, what we then do is we collate that information internally and create these, uh, nice big um, automated systems for ourselves where we can go through and select certain display requirements and then it pumps out at the end uh, a nice collated list of you know three or four options that meet all those requirements and then we can go to our customers and say you know you wanted to meet xyz these are the solutions that meet that which one do you want okay sounds good um then we've also got another question from matthias he's asking about burning what's the situation that's something i think that most of us have experienced over the years i, I can remember going into um, into shops or stores or restaurants that have used displays and you see this this burnt in image from from weeks months years possibly of, of having the same menu put up on the on the mm. on the screen uh, what's what's the situation like today with displays that are always on mm, so we can um, use technology such as um, like an IPS so with TFT technology there's TN um, which is typically the, the older type of technology, there are now IPS panels, which have helped to combat that uh, burning requirement. We've also had a couple of applications where on a software level, um, our customers have designed it so that the image uh, constantly sort of refreshes in the background that isn't seen to the human eye. But as far as the display is concerned, it's enough of a refresh to kind of combat that potential burning that may occur. So there's a, there's a few solutions that we've seen used in the market. Um, it's, it's all about sort of that live and learn, really. Yeah. And is, I mean, is burning a problem also for displays which are continuously showing rolling video, or is it only an issue for displays where a, 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 a fixed image is always on display, like the photo yeah. of, a, of a product or uh, an industrial display with, with soft buttons? Only one that's really got a static image on the screen where those pixels aren't changing. The, the only time it may be a consideration for a video is if you've say got constant video playing on it on, on on the file but in the corner you may have your company logo for example and if that company okay. logo is never changing it may become a problem in that small subsector of the display so it's something to consider on that on a constant basis yeah okay we're going to go back to another question here mm, certainly um and this is an interesting one as well um so what about 3d touch detection now I think having when I last had the opportunity to go to an, an exhibition, it was uh, in Embedded World almost two years ago. Now, um, there was a lot of discussion from companies there regarding 3D interfaces where we can sort of hover our hands over an interface, whether it be a display or, or maybe just a, a button to open the door on a lift, for example, in order that we avoid actually touching anything and also COVID is, is the big issue, uh, passing on germs, uh, cleanliness. Um, is that something that's coming up in discussion a lot now for your customers? Definitely. I mean, I think it's always been there in the market with the use of infrared technology um, because that, that could offer that kind of sort of small hover above the surface um, that, that you may anticipate. But because of the performance issues with it, it's never really took off in that regard. Um, 
But as you said, with COVID, because there's a bigger need now for touch services where you don't actually have to physically touch the screen, we've seen a massive boom in the industry in, the, in uh, developments in the hover touch technology that we, uh, we refer to it as. We've actually got an application we're working on with a, uh, with a certain customer where we have the hover touch function available on the controller. We're not enabling it for the application, but it's just being sat there in the background just in case if at one point they want to switch it on, then by all means they can. The, the big issue with we find in the market may come with um, with public uses because the public is so trained with the use of their mobile phones and their tablets to physically touch a screen. Nowadays, when you see a touch screen on, say, you know, the self checkout um, kiosks, you automatically want to go up and touch it. And I think it's going to be that retraining of the public that you don't actually have to touch the touch screen to make exactly, it function. Yeah. I mean, that that's going to be the hurdle. I think you're right. I think it's going to be one of the, the big challenges. I know that uh, I went into McDonald's recently and therefore they're big, mm. huge screens for, for ordering. Yeah. And um, you're ready to touch the screen. It's exactly what you do with a phone. So yeah. I think that's that's probably going to be the biggest hurdle to these 3D and hovering type um, interfaces, un unless they're immediately obvious that they're that type of, of interface. So, OK. Um, that's great. So we've we've covered now uh, displays. We've looked at uh, some of the the touch solutions and the the advantages and, and disadvantages of the touch interfaces that are available to go with the displays at the moment. I think the last piece of the puzzle now is the is driving the displays and getting the image onto the display itself. And for that, you typically take a, a single board computer. So when it comes to specifying my single board computer, what do I need to consider what options are available? Um, how, how do you guide me to something that's gonna, gonna work for me? I think it comes back to those initial questions I asked, such as the, the architecture that's used, making sure that it can drive the resolution that we're nominating for that display. Um, but in terms of how we then assist with interfacing from the SPC to the, to the display, um, we can offer the creation of, of LVDS cables to link directly from the SPC to the display. And drive it directly from that, offer some um, BIOS support to configure the SBC to support that display. Um, if that maybe is too complex for the project, we can uh, simply offer a, a controller card for the display that takes those native LVS signals from the display and converts it down to something more manageable like a HDMI or a display port input and a, and a 12 volt DC um, power input. And uh, is there any real difference to using LVDS versus HDMI or, or D port uh, for for the quality of the output or the ease with which you can interface or, or the even the distance over which I can I can drive the signals? For ease of interface, I mean HDMI is definitely a, a, a quicker plug and play type application. You know, we we can just supply the board. You buy a HDMI cable off of Amazon. And, and plug it in and it works. Um, LVDS cables, um, they have to be engineered and configured exactly to the pinout of the of the SVC in the display, which can be anything up to say uh, 20 to 40 pins that we need to configure and get correctly. So it, it does take a lot more work, um, but it cuts down on some cost for applications. That's where we, where we tend to need to use that type of application. But um, HDMI cables, they can, go much longer distances than, uh, than LVDS cables as well. LVDS, we don't tend to want to go any further than maybe uh, a meter. So if, you, if your SBC is going to be quite some distance away from the display, HDMI display port is probably the way to go. If you're looking to make a compact system and make sure you keep the cost down, then LVDS is probably the way to go. Now, with LVDS, is that a standardized interface um, or you know, is it is it variable? My my understanding was over LVDS, the the, the number of bits per color could be different depending on the display. Yeah, and that's where the configuration comes in. So so the the term LVDS is standard in the industry, but every almost every display that we look at has a different pinout on the back of the display, and every board we look at will have a different pinout on the board, and that's where this engineering of the configuration of the cable comes in. Um, and as you rightly said, there, there are then different timings for the display, different color bit ratios that have to then be configured on the SVC. So it is a more complex process. But if, if it's a project that's in volume, cost needs to be down and compact is a, is a consideration, it's definitely worthwhile for us to look at. 
And also when we come to HDMI and DisplayPort, I've had um, various computers over the years, some of them have a display port on them. I think it was a, a technology that was developed and promoted by Dell for a time. And mm. I've managed to get adapters from, from display port to HDMI. Is there a difference between the two? To the naked eye, not not really. Um, it, as you said, you can buy adapters and interchange between the two. Um, over time, HDMI and DisplayPort have had so many different revisions in their standards that HDMI can, uh, at this point in time, be somewhat comparable to DisplayPort. DisplayPort does offer the ability to go to much higher resolutions, such as your, your 8Ks at 120 hertz, um, but that's not really a common application at this time, so HDMI um, it's still quite a, a common interface for us at the moment. Now, obviously, the, the SBCs provide a, a range of options. Are there any particular popular um, processors um, that are available or what influences maybe the pricing of, a, of an SBC? Uh, processor is definitely a, a big influence on the SBC um, in terms of if there's any popular I guess on an, on an x86 architecture for an Intel, um, whatever project we're working on, we always get asked to nominate the latest Intel architecture. Um, I suppose that's that's the big driving factor. But once we've nominated a project with a certain architecture, that thing will run for you know five, six, seven, eight years um, and continue in production. And we, we, we won't look at the redesign until that product potentially goes end of life. And ARM-type processors, are there any particular suppliers which are regularly found on SBCs and suitable for these types of applications? Probably suppliers such as, we typically deal with them more on, the Germ on our German side of the business, but it's uh, companies like Advantech, uh, Convitec, guys like that. Um, we tend to use people like A-Value, Axiom Tech, ASRock, which are much heavier suited to the x86 architecture. And that's, to be honest, a lot of what our customers um, tend to nominate for, for the applications where we're supplying the SBC. Um, if that doesn't suit, they tend to then be designing their own PCB with, uh, with some sort of microcontroller on board. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting point that you bring up there and something that I wanted to, to move on to. So there's obviously plenty of applications out there as well which are microcontroller based. We have everything from small 8-bit up to 32-bit uh, mm. controllers. And these, these are basically available in all sorts of applications from, from washing machines and, and coffee machines through to industrial, uh, industrial systems, test and measurement equipment and... Um, and things like that. What sort of um, display interfaces are then fit, fit uh, in use there for, 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 the, uh, for the displays that are suitable for that type of application, sort of smaller sub seven inch say displays? Yeah, so the, those larger displays, they're, they're, they're typically LPS, but as you say, for the smaller displays, uh, it tends to get switched up a bit. And we're then dealing with interfaces such as RGB, SPI, uh, MIPI, um, just, to, just to name a few, and we've developed some of our own small controller boards to then convert those into maybe more manageable interfaces such as HDMI in those applications where we need to get a, a quick sample up and run in front of the customer where they don't have the time to develop that baseboard and they want to see it there and then, and we can provide those plug and play kits necessary to get that done. Now, um, one of the big topics that's currently going through the industry at the minute, and we've also covered it in the Elector magazine um, last year, is the situation with COVID and the pressures that that has placed on the supply chain. Obviously, one aspect of it is the semiconductor industry. They've had to uh, reduce the amount of um, staff that are operating on, on some parts of the supply chain, and that's delayed the speed with which products can come be delivered to customers. And mm. also because the automotive industry basically turned off their request for product at some point, um, yeah. a lot of the capacity has been taken over by other companies who actually did want product. People making, for example, displays and tablets and, um, and cameras for, for people who were working from home or learning from home. What's been your experience over the last two years of the, the pressures uh, on the supply chain for your customers, for SBCs and, and these industrial displays? Yeah, it's interesting because you mentioned that um, the, the, the supply chains got switched over to people who were producing like 
like laptops, for example, you know, everyone started working from home. So automatically the production line started switching over to um, LCDs that were used for, for laptops. And that caused us a big issue because they're, those aren't the types of displays that we use for industrial applications. We use industrial TFTs, not ones designed for laptops. So it created a, a problem for us, but one that we've been able to manage through our um, warehouse in Germany. We we tend to hold a degree of stock um, in the region of about 2 million euro at any given time. And that's really helped us um, support our customers in and with those supply chain issues. Long term, we have had to advise customers of what the lead times are. Um, but for customers that are making product, which is the kinds of people we deal with, um, they're more than happy to commit to those schedules to, to get through these tough times. Just hopefully in the in the future we'll um we'll start to see those lead times come down to something that we were more familiar with say a couple of years ago. Uh, it used so, to be eight weeks, and now sometimes we talk about fifty two weeks. It's uh, it's crazy really? times. Mm. Okay. And those are some of those microcontrollers we've we've heard from customers have they've been trying to source um, controllers that would have previously been off the shelf, and now they get told, "Yep, twenty twenty three." It's like what? <laughs> Surely that's not right. That's a typo, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. I have to agree that through Twitter, which is one of my key sources for electronics information from the mm. community, you see a lot of makers there, you see a lot of smaller businesses who are manufacturing in small quantities. They're continuously posting these these 52 week or even longer lead times for mm. microcontrollers and they're sitting there wondering yeah. whenever, when am I going to get product again? Mm. So I think when we were talking to some of the semiconductor industry suppliers, one of the things they were highlighting was a need for forecasting. They're saying that it's yeah. you can't, although we're very much used to being able to go to some of our distributors and them having product on the shelf. And you know, if I want a hundred more next month, I just buy a hundred more. That mm. um, nowadays we need a bit more insight into upcoming requirements in terms of purchasing. Are you also looking to get better forecasts from from your customers? Yeah, and we've definitely seen that over the last, say, nine months, um, there seems to be a, a shift in that people are becoming more um, more available to supply those forecasts. We've got orders, for instance, where we'd say, quote, 26 week lead time, because that is potentially what it's going to be. Um, we place the orders, those, those 26 week lead times are then confirmed. But for the most part, we've been able to pull that forward. And say 15 years ago that might have been how the industry works you know you used to place these orders and eventually you'd get a delivery time and that seems to be the way that the market is shifting again now hopefully for the better for us it's not going to stay that way but if it is i feel it's manageable that's good to hear so i think that's an important thing for those out there looking to get their uh, orders in and uh, get to hopefully their manufacturing back to back to normal uh, I've heard recently, for example, here that some of the automotive industry is actually closing down their manufacturing plants due to lack of available availability of cable looms, mm. and that's been impacted by what's going on in Ukraine currently. So mm. you know, these these uh, disruptions come along in in different ways. Uh, I think the the challenge with COVID for many people has been that um, it's affected everybody all at the same time in yeah. every aspect, from from <clears throat> logistics to manufacturing to um, getting raw materials. Um, one of the other things I wanted to ask was related back to the more related back to the SBCs, but also a little with respect to forecasting and, and maybe circumventing uh, some of the supply issues. Um, Raspberry Pi has been a big and popular solution that we've seen grow immensely over the last 10 years. It's just had its 10th anniversary. Is, is Raspberry Pi a platform that you're seeing your customers turn to and is it really suited to industrial type applications or isn't it, in your opinion, quite there yet? Um, do we see our customers use it? Yes. Is it suited for industrial applications? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we, we, we come up against this. Some of our customers, they, they nominate the Pi uh, for a project, which is sometimes great for, for, for a prototype. Um, you know, but then coming into production, it's not necessarily there. You, you're up against um, sudden PCN and ECN changes. Um, whereas the industrial market for industrial products, you get at least six to 12 months notice for things like that. And that's key when you're making a product. So when our customers have taken the pie to production, sometimes they've come up against these issues and then come back to us and said, oh, 
Alex, you were right. We, we shouldn't have used that in production. We, now let's now let's start talking about you know what you can provide on on an industrial roadmap. It's like, yep, <laughs> let's let's go to, let's go down that that road. <laughs> and those customers then don't tend to go anywhere else because they trust us because they we gave them that correct advice to begin with. Now, one of the things that also interests me when I was looking at some of the case studies that you've uh, worked on in the past is the fact that. Um, there's installations of many, many displays, sometimes in a shopping center. There's also an example mm -hmm. of one in a German church, for example, where they have information displays actually built into the pews. How do your customers go about um, organizing all of those displays, keeping them up to date and um, keeping the firmware up to date, keeping the, the images up to date and, and ensuring that they're, they're running correctly? Because I'm, I'm sure everybody's had a, a situation where they've walked into a store and they've seen a display where the Windows uh, screen is, is up or yeah. the BIOS is, is on display with a, a missing drive um, message. Um, what do your, how do your customers implement complete systems? So I've, I've actually got a customer who's um, looking at this exact issue now for a 27 inch monitor that we're supplying and they're based in the retail sector. So they essentially want to just be able to write into the system um, and check whether it's healthy, basically, and whether it needs to be turned on off, if the brightness needs to be decreased or increased or if the whole system needs to be rebooted. Um, we're not providing the system for that, but what we have done is provided them with, with an RS232 interface on the rear side of the monitor. Um, and a uh, intelligent enough controller that enables you to go in and diagnose that display remotely for a for an SBC that's connected to a network. If we are providing the SBC, then obviously we, we can do that just built into the monitor. Um, but there, there are different options depending on what we're being asked to provide for the project. Well, that's good to hear because I was as an engineer when you see something like that, it's, it's very disappointing. You, you know it's a, an engineering problem that can be solved. Um, yeah. It's obviously just then a choice as to whether you want to solve it and how much energy and effort you want to put into it. So that's great. Yeah, it, it's trying to make everything. It, it almost seems like the industry wants to do everything remotely. I mean, you look at everyone that's working from home at the moment. Uh, you know, we, we're doing this. Um, you know, you, I'm, I'm miles away from you. Um, likewise, I think support engineers want to try and do a similar thing. They, they don't want to always have to go on site just to flick a switch on and off. They want to be able to do that from, from comfort their, their sofa maybe <laughs> there, yeah i've i did travel halfway across germany just to plug in a power supply once so yeah yeah I, there we go <laughs> <laughs> super we're coming rapidly towards the end of the show but before we go i would like to just take a quick look at our questions and um see what else we can talk about so um one question's out there is about embedded world now if you don't know embedded world is the biggest exhibition in the world dedicated to embedded systems and embedded systems development. It's here in Germany, in Nuremberg every year. It was supposed to happen in February, but it's been pushed out, I think, to June, uh, the June timeframe. I don't have the, the dates in my head at the minute. And they've been asking if we're going to be attending as a lector. Uh, I understand we are going to be there. I'm personally definitely going to be there because it's the, the one place to go and find out what's going on. Um, to our friend Dom who posed the question about where to get your display information. Obviously exhibitions when they're up and running again are a great opportunity to go and see what's going on. Um, uh, Alex, do you um, attend any exhibitions? What's what's the big ones for you? Um, we've, we've been trying and testing a couple of different ones in the UK. Uh, I mean you mentioned our fire load screens. We went actually went to a fire exhibition last year and it worked out quite well for us. Um, We've we we just visit ISC now in in, um, in in Europe. I think we're going to it this year, but I think it's just a, a case of we're just going to go and see and sort of test the water, see what everyone thinks at the moment. Um, likewise, with embedded world, I think we're just going to visit it and see see what what kind of reactions there are on the market to go into a go into a, a conference now. Super. Well, if you're there. Tell me, we'll meet up, have a drink, and Definitely. Uh, I'll, sh I'll show you around. <laughs> in there often enough to know where everybody yeah, is. That'll be great. They'll do. <laughs> <laughs> Super. Um, I also have another question related back to the topic of touch. Um, it's asked about uh, non-human fingers, um, such as gloves and things like that. So I think we we touched on the topic of of gloves before, but maybe you could explain uh, a little bit more about the tuning process that's required when. Um, I know that sort of glove thickness has a has a role. D 
does the glove material make a difference and do you need to tune then for the different types of glove that are intended to be used in the application? Yeah, certainly. So I, I think a, a great application that everyone would probably know is you, you can you can get your standard woolly gloves that you wear in the winter and then you can get some that have got those little coloured tips to sign and signify that they're, they're able to use with a phone screen and, and they work on your phone. Um, similar to, to what we do, um, we've had some applications, medical ones, where we've submitted a touch screen and it just works out the box with quite a thin uh, medical grade glove, whereas other applications we've submitted a touch screen and they've tried to use it with quite a thick, uh, rigorous uh, fireman's glove and that doesn't work, but we have been able to go in and tune it to function. Um, there's actually a video on our YouTube channel, I believe, that, that demonstrates us um, using a 12.1 inch touch screen with water on the screen, a industrial glove and a chainmail glove over the top of that. And we're still able to draw some squiggles. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite impressive. Um, it is. There's another question that came up, which I think was be interesting just to touch on. Um, oh, thank you. Buzra's just um, messaged me that the embedded world is the 21st to the 23rd yeah, of okay. June. I should have had that burnt into my memory like a dis badly <laughs> tuned display. <laughs> um, so Pratt H has also written in, um, they're based in the US, and they're asking, um, do display, uh, the, well, asking the question, is, is display tuning complicated? I, I guess we also touched a little bit on that. I, I guess it relates a little bit to LVDS, but you know, if I've got a simple display yeah. of HDMI, do I just connect it and go, or what other tuning is relevant for an application? Yeah, no, so if, if we're just using a standard HDMI input, it's just um, plug and play. Uh, but as you say, for, for LDS, um, complicated, I wouldn't say it's complicated. Um, we we just have to go into the single ball computer's BIOS settings and uh, adjust to say what, what color bit ratio the display needs, um, what resolution it needs, whether it's LED or a CCFL panel. Not that we come up against CCFL much, but that strangely is still an option on some of the biases that we see so <laughs> okay there's some out there um, but it, it's quite a quick process and we can normally do it in, within sort of 10 minutes and when it comes to setting up the contrast and the brightness of the display is that something that's controlled over the hdmi or lvds interface or is that something that has to be done via a separate channel uh, it's just something that's normally native to the to the spec of the display but we do we can then go into the the osd menu of the, the display itself and start adjusting things like brightness mm -hmm. and contrast ratio and, uh, and color levels such as red, green, and blue to, to get some different color levels out. And is, is that OSD interface available also on an, a physical interface or do I have to do it through buttons like I would do on my, uh, my monitor for my, my desktop? Yeah, it's normally, it's normally physical buttons. That's our standard interface, but we can offer um, a software package for our own um, Prisma cars where you can do that remotely from the SBC for, via an RS232 connection to it. Okay, super. Well, I'm just looking at the list of questions here at the minute, and that seems to be everything. So thank you, everybody, for those uh, insightful questions. And yeah, thank you. it's been great to be able to pose those to Alex. Um, so thanks ever so much, um, because, uh, yeah, like I said, that's all we have time for today. Um, been talking here to Alex Munden from Display Technology, and we've been learning from his expertise in specifying displays and touchscreens, as well as understanding the current supply chain issues that are going on around the SBCs and display market. Now, before we leave you today, I'd just like to share with you what's coming up in the future. So, um, going to add that there. Oh. Still learning how to use the interface here. So I'm just going <laughs> to bring, bring that up again. There we go. Super. So, yes, thank you very much for joining us. Um, coming up next time, I'm going to be taking a look at Risk 5 with Martin Kroom from Green Waves and Simon Davidman from Imperus. We'll discover what's so exciting about this new processor architecture, why it's so flexible and the challenges that await those wanting to use it in their designs. And if that is too far in the future for you, you can read my article, What is Risk 5 on the Elector magazine website shown on the screen now. And if you wish, you can also get in touch at any time. The show details are here at the bottom of the screen. 
Um, so if you want to see what else we've got planned for the future, you can just drop by the Elector Engineering Insights page at electormagazine.com slash Elector Engineering Insights. So thank you very much uh, today uh, from you, Alex. Um, just before we thank go, you. I have one more question, which is namely, what's the babyface guru hashtag? <laughs> Great question. So essentially when I join project discussions because of my noticeable uh, baby face, um, I get met with sometimes this uh, predisposition that I am not too knowledgeable in the industry when in fact I've got almost seven years experience. So when I'm after discussing with the client for maybe sort of 10, 15 minutes, they then realize, oh, this guy actually knows his stuff. So hence, you know, they start off thinking of me as a baby face and then realize I'm a guru. So I've, uh, I've taken the, the name of baby face guru on, on my social platforms. <laughs> <laughs> and some of my customers have started calling me it now. <laughs> so it must be working. <laughs> Well, I think there's no doubt today you've shown us your expertise. I'm really pleased that you joined us here today as my first interview guest on the show. And no, with thank that, you for having me. you're welcome. With that, we're going to wrap it up for today. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Don't forget, if you'd like to join me as a guest, write me an email, drop me a tweet, or reach out to me, Stuart Cording, on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining us. Stay in touch. And don't forget to keep asking your engineering questions.